Hello everyone, this is Richard from Modern Healthspan and welcome to the fifth in our series of interviews with Dr. Michael Snyder of Stanford University. In this video, Dr. Snyder will talk about ageotypes, defined as the part of the body where the aging process was most active based on research study that he led. First, let me briefly go through the paper from the research. The paper was published earlier this year in Nature Medicine and is entitled Personal Aging, Markers and the Ageotype Revealed by Deep Longitudinal Profiling. The study tracked 106 healthy individuals aged between 29 and 75, taking blood and biological samples to investigate each person at a deep molecular level. They carried out tests at least five times over two years in order to record any changes, with Dr. Snyder even taking part as a subject of his own research. Researchers discovered four ageotypes, wherein different people, different markers changed over time. Those involved in the trial tended to age most within the immune system, kidney, liver, or at the metabolic level. Ageotypes may provide a molecular assessment of personal aging reflective of personal lifestyle and medical history that may ultimately be useful in monitoring and intervening in the aging process. I, I saw you talked about ageotypes, like people age differently, right? And so measuring your age accurately using some mechanism like DNA methylation or the epigenetic age. Um, so can you talk about that? I mean, what were the different types and, and how does it affect the way people age? Yeah, so aging historically has been studied what we say cross-sectionally, where they'll look at old folks and young folks and say, oh, these markers, these biochemical markers are higher in old people and lower in young people, like your glucose, your hemoglobin A1C. And that's traditionally how it's been studied. And what was special about us, because we're following people over time, what we discovered is that most people actually don't change their molecules much. Mm. And our, our, our molecular composition is very, very different from one another. Meaning um, if we, when we have people who um, we're profiling again very deeply and we'll take more samples when they get a viral infection or when they exercise, I'll come back to that in a minute. So they will shift their profile when something like that comes along when uh, an adverse event or a change like exercise, they'll shift their profile, but they still look more like themselves than anyone else. So what that means is that the difference between the disease you and the healthy you is smaller than the difference between people. Mm -hmm. And historically, the way people run studies is that, again, that's cross-sectional. They'll study thousands of people uh, in, in a certain case, like old versus young or healthy versus disease. And they need lots and lots of people because to pick up that signal between, you know, old versus young or between disease versus healthy, because that it's so, it's so small, uh, within the person relative to all the people signature, you need a lot of people to get that signal. I don't mm -hmm. know if that makes sense. So, um, the power, though, of following the same person is you can't miss that signal if it's you. That is to say, if I'm following the healthy you versus the disease you, when you get an illness, that delta you can't miss. That's the most important thing we've learned. The same is true for aging. So we're following people. They have, we have different molecular compositions. So we can follow people and say, all right. Uh, they're all very different, but what's happening over time? And it turns out there's about 600 molecules of the 20,000 we study routinely. There's about 600 molecules that will change over time uh, with age. And so we can measure that. And we think you only need five measurements in a period as short as two years or less. And we can tell how people are aging. It turns out that when we did our analyses, just like other people have found, we found all the same markers, glucose, things like that. They're higher, they change, you know, they go up over time on average. We follow what people did. But when you look at the individual per pe person, people are aging differently. And that turns out to be very cool. So as an example, there's one person we call a cardio ager. It turns out their cardio, um, their heart molecules, even though we're measuring in blood, 
they're actually changing over time more than any other kinds of molecules. And for me, it turns out, you know, I'm a kind of typical ager, my, call my coagulation pathway, uh, my metabolic pathway, certain things change over time. Interestingly though, uh, my immune isn't changing so much, my, my immune molecules. So different people are aging differently and that turns out to be really cool and really important we think. So what we had was 43 people with enough data, we could follow them over time. We said, all right, how are people aging? And they're all aging differently. Uh, mm -hmm. And not only that, they're all aging at different rates. So some of them are, their biological age is older than their chronological age, meaning they're acting, they're older than they really are. And for other people, it's the opposite. Their biological age is younger than their actual chronological age. And, and their slopes are very different. Some people are aging more rapidly, some less so. So we can follow all those. But most importantly, we could start grouping people into aging types. We call them agotypes. Mm -hmm. So that is to say, uh, we think there are many kinds of agotypes, but we didn't have so many people, 43. So we said, well, what are the major categories? And it turns out we found four. So we found some people are metabolic agers, other people are kidney agers, other people are liver agers, and the fourth category is immunoagers. Mm -hmm. Now, some people are aging in all those categories, all four. Okay. Some people will be aging in three of the four categories. Some only in one. We'll have some people are metabolic agers. Some people are liver agers. Some people will be the rank kidney. So different people, again, they're, they're, they're aging differently. Uh, as I say, and, and when you group me into the major classes, I age for liver, kidney, and metabolic, but not immune aging. So um, anyway, so why is that a big deal? Well, we think that's a big deal because you can act on it. First of all, we're measuring this in a short enough time frame. So you may or may not realize that there's a lot of stuff out there where people make claims about longevity, right? You take these supplements, you'll live a lot longer. You walk into a, you know, any of these stores, most of that stuff's probably snake oil, right? It's just total BS. But it, we, but there's no way to know because if you take that stuff, how would you know if you're getting better or not? There are not good markers for aging. So what's powerful about what we've learned is that we can follow how people are aging individually. And then if you do shift that, you could actually pick that up. And it turns out when we group people in these different categories of aging, we started following them individually. And there are clinical markers in these categories. So that is to say, uh, they're like one of the markers, this is pro this, a um, marker called hemoglobin A1C, again, a measure of, of glucose. And for the cohort as a whole, it goes up. But when you actually look at people, uh, for four people, statistically significantly it did go up, as you would expect. But there were four people where it actually went down. So those guys had gotten there to go down. Then we looked in detail. Well, it turns out two of them had taken up exercise. One of them lost weight. So they actually had shifted some key markers that were part of their agotype. And so what that shows is that you can intervene and reverse some of these trends, at least at some level. Now, that's also true. There's another marker called creatinine, which is a measure of kidney function. Again, for a cohort as a whole, it went up. But there were actually um, 10 people where it went down. So statistically significantly. We don't fully understand it, but eight of the 10 people are on stats, which is kind of cool. They were, but they're on stats the whole time. But something about them suggests that they may have an improvement in kidney function. So anyway, we can tease out, we can see how people are aging, and we think the information's actionable. Uh, so how would you act on it? Well, I mentioned some things for the metabolic ager, but there's lots of different ways. If you're a kidney ager, maybe you should drink more water. If you're an immunoager, maybe you want to take some of these more immunosuppressants like ginger and you know um, turmeric, um, which is found in coumarin, so a lot of Indian food has anti-inflammatories. So you can see how you might change your lifestyle to accommodate this. Certainly, if you're a metabolic ager, exercise um, um, and diet would be a big deal as well. Uh, we would argue the cardio ager, uh, that person could actually go on drugs perhaps. We, after the fact, we discovered they were uh, severe hypertensive. So they probably had some cardiovascular disease issues. 
and they probably need some follow-up assays and perhaps maybe they should go on drugs, I don't know. But, or they, minimally, they'd probably want to change their exercise. So we think the information, so first of all, we can classify, we can, people, we can determine how people are aging and put them in these age types. But in, second, we think it should lead to suggestions about how they might intervene. Uh, we think that we can convert this into a test. Right now, there is not a good test for how you're aging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the best one out there is the methylation assay, which I think is pretty good, but it's not fast enough. The markers we have will be much, much faster. In terms of you'd be able to take them at, at more frequent intervals and see a, a difference? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so right. if you measure them, uh, say, over a year and a half, you'll know how you're aging. So two okay. years, for sure, but we think even shorter, and eight, a year and a half will be the trick. And Excellent. with that information, then you could potentially intervene. Right. Thank you all for watching, and I hope that you found the video informative. Early results have shown that it is possible to slow down the rate of aging after making lifestyle choices. The research is an early stage, but could herald the development of personalized lifestyle advice and tailored medical treatment for individuals depending on their ageotype. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and will speak to you again soon.